When you talk about the paradigm, and, and you and I have talked a lot about, again, the skeletal muscle adaptation, do you then decide after you've picked how many exercises are you picking? And, and I understand that there's a spectrum, but just take us through from a beginner standpoint, yeah. how many exercises, what kind of loads, what kind does tempo matter? Mm-hmm. How can we frame everything up to just say, you know what? I listen to Pat. Yep. And I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow. I'm talking to you, mom, and you're going. They're going to execute. Yeah. I, so I think that like where where this f- leads us is sort of this topic of the constraints of hypertrophy for so like, and and I'll tell you like Mike Isretel from Renaissance. Period he's coming Station. on the he's coming on the pod. Oh, amazing! I mean, this is like on the pod. this is his wheelhouse. Like he has. Uh, Videos on YouTube, like like there's like these foundational RP videos, mm-hmm. and like he has this whole constraints of hypertrophy series that I think is fantastic and very very well constructed, and okay. he's amazing. So I'm excited. You know, I, I think that this this really is is a big part of my mentality in terms of what I'm talking about from these these concepts as well. So I think you know number one with from a specificity standpoint, we need to target and stimulate the major muscles that would be lumbo, pelvic, femoral, so lumbar spine, pelvis, and femur, and then thoraco, scapulo, humeral. So, you know, the, the thoracic spine, the scapula, and the humerus. And so if I'm going to get those muscles, like I said, it's some kind of a hinge, some kind of a squat, some kind of a horizontal push, some kind of a horizontal pull, some kind of a vertical push, some kind of a vertical pull. Mm -hmm. Those are the big categories that I lay out as like, these are sort of the the foundational essential patterns that you need to Everybody should be doing, you agree with this, Yeah. life is better this way, Mm -hmm. and everyone should be doing this. So that, and that has really been in the textbooks for a long time, and and that that has not changed. Once a beginner chooses these exercises, um, how many exercises should they choose? Yep. And I think that we put this together. We looked at, um, I have to look here, but I think that when we were talking about it, you said we defined the categories of resistance training just logistically. You said starting at anywhere from eight to 24 sets per week, mm-hmm. five to 30 reps, Yep. two days a week. Yep. I'm going to repeat that for everybody. And again, you guys, we have a program for you to check out and it's starting at eight sets, eight to 24 sets. So that's, um, per week Mm -hmm. and five to 30 reps. Yeah. Two days a week. Yeah. I mean, I think like what the, and again, this is very Mike Isretel like based and, and he does a great job. I think of, of having a really big picture view Mm -hmm. of, of all of the research on this. And then having these sorts of like upper and lower ends that make sense depending on, on what we seem to know from the evidence. And, and I think that what's important is like to point out, number one, science is not an N equals one phenomenon. Like it's a- it's, What do you mean? Tell me more. So science speaks in generalities, okay? So these recommendations are going to be for average, you know what I mean? Like the, like- Every individual person can fall above or below these sorts of boundaries. And so I think that's important to understand is that like what I'm going to present to you is is probably the most middle of the road sort of a thought process. But there is extremes that can exist and people can fall into extremes or so when we're talking about this, this is sort of like upper and lower ends that like if you're going bowling, like we have kind I've of the gutters, never been, bo- you get the gutters on both sides. We want to avoid the gutters. We want to roll the ball down the middle and have it hit the You pins. mean you're not supposed to just put it, now I know, I know when it ever invites me bowling. Okay. So, you know, what the research seems to suggest is that in order for muscles to grow, somewhere around a minimum of, of like 10 sets a week is, is about the, the level. You know, so Mm -hmm. if I want my biceps to grow, 10 sets for the biceps done per week is like the the minimum, it seems. Now, the problem with 
being a person, is that that which used to work for you will cease to work for you as you make progress and improvements. Do we know how long that is? So you def- do you define a beginner who is doing resistance training through a period of weeks? Would it be six to eight weeks or is it just overall training age? When someone who is listening to this, they say, okay, well, am I a beginner? Am I intermediate? How yeah. fast can I expect some kind of gains or hypertrophy? Yeah. Well, I think that a beginner... A beginner is someone that can improve, make progressive quantitative improvements session to session. I learned that from you, and I I thought that was very interesting. A beginner is someone who is going to make progression from day to day. Is that right? Day to day, week to week, or is it day to day? It's very common if I have a, a new guy that comes in, never lifted weights before in his life, and like we put put him on the bench press on Monday. Uh, struggled to get the bar, you know, got the bar for five reps. It was wobbly and shaky. He comes back in on Wednesday and gets the bar for 20 reps, you know, and I'm like, whoa, okay. Comes back in on Friday and I put tens on both sides of the bar and he gets it for 20 reps. And then it's like, you know, he's made hundreds of percentage points improvements across mm. a week. And and that can happen. Like it's, it's just every system in the body is is sensitive and fresh and new to learning with this stuff. And it's like, you know, exponential rates of gains very quickly session to session. Do you, you see that strength is probably neurological adaptation. Sure. There's a, a whole host of reasons. Strength will happen faster than hypertrophy. Yes. How long? And, you know, I was looking at some of this data. I spoke to Don Lehman about it. I messaged Sue Phillips about it. It seems as if... Um, it is so variable. Mm-hmm. If, if someone is new, let's say a new drug free, um, they uh, could potentially put on two pounds of skeletal muscle a month. Yeah. Maybe if yeah. it's a, a young man, I don't know. Do we have a cadence for middle aged men and women mm-hmm. who are eating a higher protein diet and in a, a an appropriate calorie range? Yeah. Do we know how fast they can put on muscle? I don't think that there's, I, I mean, look, like I, I, I'm i sure that there's, I bet there is some research somewhere that actually tackles this. I'm not mm-hmm. aware of, of that information. What I usually hear is people that, you know, they generally talk about like, look, like what we're really dealing with is you're putting on grams of muscle tissue per week, you know, like, right. so it's, it's a frustrating game in, in reality because, like, the rate of adaptation is so slow that it's, mm. like, frustrating for most people because your mind is going a lot faster. Like, the pace of modern society is a lot faster. But, unfortunately, physiology is from the Stone Age and it goes really slow. And the sensitivity of our testing. The majority yeah. of individuals measuring body composition will get a DEXA. Right. DEXA is not very sensitive to those very small changes. Right, right. An individual may be training, putting everything into it, and, I don't know, not seeing gains until they yeah. see gains. And that, that can be very challenging for people. I think that, though, like the an easier way to think about this is that there is – a sequence of adaptations that happens in response to resistance training. And it generally works from superficial to deep. So the first changes that take place will be neurological. Um, and then, you know, you'll improve the, the firing and the sequence of the nerves that speak to the muscles for a movement. So you'll use more muscle fibers of an individual muscle to be able to power a movement. And then you'll begin to recruit additional muscles as well to contribute to that, that movement. Uh, and then the next series of adaptations would go to the muscle tissue. Uh, and what we know is that there is a sequence of what sorts of proteins we synthesize. So the first kinds of proteins that you'll synthesize will be structural proteins. So the, you know, your muscle cells are made up of kind of like, uh, barriers cell to cell. Um, you know, you have a, a Z disc that divides specific fibers from one another. And then you have kind of a lattice like network of, of structural proteins that actually have formed what's called the cytoskeleton. So the, basically the foundation and the infrastructure of the cell itself, uh, and things like Titan is a, is a, 
prolific structural protein. But you will synthesize those first. Basically, you're, you're building a stronger foundation for the cell, and you're making it assembled in a way where it's more robust. After that, you'll synthesize contractile protein. So actin myosin that are actually the things that create tension and pull and shorten the cell and are able to demonstrate force production externally. And would that be myofibrillar proteins? Yes. And the, the mention before that, are you talking about sarcoplasmic hypertrophy or is this more just ribosomal? No, it's, it's ribosomal protein synthesis. Okay. Okay. It's just that you have the structural proteins first. And from what I understand from a timeline perspective, it's typically like two to four weeks, I believe, where you're going to be doing structural protein synthesis. And then following that, you will begin to go into uh, contractile protein synthesis. And that will take place for, you know, weeks, like anywhere like weeks three, four, up to like 12 to 16 weeks. So it's funny because people like the topic of exercise variation can get brought up and people varying exercises, switching exercises. And I'm kind of like, you don't really want to switch exercises in my mind for a minimum of like 12 weeks because people will switch exercises every four weeks. And I'm like, you just went through neurological relearning and structural protein synthesis, and you didn't even start contractile protein synthesis for the motor units for that specific exercise. Stick with one exercise for at least 12 weeks to be able to actually create protein synthesis of contractile proteins for those muscles. And if you can continuously do some kind of progressive overload, would you ever have to switch your training program? I mean, aside from being very yeah. bored, but... I mean, would there ever be yeah, a physiological I think, need? I think that there's real world logistical mm -hmm. things that you have to consider. Like if you get really strong at a specific exercise, it can kind of beat you down, you know, like you're connected. So again, like it's the sequence of adaptation that, that really gets interesting because again, it goes from superficial to deep nerves and then muscles are, are what will adapt next structural and then contractile. Then the next tissue that tends to go on into adaptation will be the connective tissue, the, the tendons in particular. And following tendons, now you get into bone remodeling. Mm -hmm. So like I said, it's just a, it's, you're getting deeper and more towards the center of the body as far as the, the adaptations actually happening. What's interesting is it does continue to go further and further after that, where you then ultimately, like the most deep adaptations are epigenetic changes at the level of like the nuclei. And then finally, uh, changes in the gamete, uh, which would be expressed genetically being passed off to the offspring. It's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. It's incredible.